Hello and welcome to Indian Standard Time. I'm Siddharth Vardarajan and joining me today on this program is Professor Marietta Stepanyans, Russian Indologist, scholar of India for many years from Russia, earlier from the Soviet Union, erstwhile Soviet Union. Welcome to the show, ma'am. Thank you. I'm happy to be back to India. Now, uh, the subject for our discussion today is Russian approaches to India, uh, the state of Russian Ind Indology and your assessment as a scholar of the state of Indian uh, philosophy in general. Uh, and I want to begin by giving our viewers uh, a sense of the current state of um, Indological studies in Russia. We know that Russia has a tradition going back over two centuries uh, of uh, studies and interest in Indology, Indian philosophy, Indian thought. In the earlier pre-revolutionary period, if the focus was more on the uh, philological uh, aspects, um, linguistic aspects, during the communist period, during the Soviet Union period, uh, Russian scholars focused more on the uh, sociological or a Marxist approach, looking, trying to relate changes in Indian thought to uh, material conditions, socioeconomic conditions, and so on. Uh, but what's the, in, in the post-Soviet Union period, how would you characterize the broad approach of uh, Indology uh, in Russia and the approach towards Indian philosophy? Well, you are right, of course, that uh, in Russia, the uh, history of Indology is about uh, more than 200 years old. And in the past, it was Sanskrit, it was uh, uh, Buddhist studies, it was classical studies. Then. Uh, uh, Ideology always uh, has its impact on education, as you understand. So in the Soviet times, uh, uh, after thirties particularly, uh, the, this impact has become very strong. And uh, the result was that Buddhological, for example, uh, studies, they were cut uh, or prosecuted sometimes. Uh, in, uh, uh, you, you mean uh, Buddhist studies? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that uh, in languages uh, uh, the uh, attention was given to uh, what they called alive uh, languages, so is living languages. Uh, Sanskrit was considered to be kind of a lat like Latin or Greek, and so more attention was given to the live language, which was good, of course, but uh, uh, the bad thing side was that the classical uh, studies were I ignored. Um, then if you, uh, for example, in my field uh, in philosophy, uh, the, uh, the greatest uh, shortcoming was that um, uh, we, uh, we tried to give uh, the, uh, we, we try to put Indian history of Indian philosophy in the context of the world philosophy. And we thought that by this way, we overcome uh, Europocentrism. But in fact, what we did, and that was in the four, um, six volume uh, history of world philosophy, which uh, was published in the 60s. In fact, what we uh, did, we uh, really mentioned all the non-Western philosophies, but we presented them uh, uh, not adequately. Uh, for example, Indian philosophy, um, Charvaka Lakait, Lakaita Charvak. Was celebrated. Uh, Charvaka Lakait. Yes, they have four pages, and Vedanta have one or two pages. Okay. On Buddhism was said something uh, negative. Uh, so, so you see, it was not a real picture of what is Indian philosophy, and um, so it was looked at through uh, conventional Marxist-Leninist yeah, lens, yeah, that dialectical it was that, historical you know, materialism. The, 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 the main line in the history of philosophy is the fight between materialism and idealism, mm -hmm. uh, rationalism and irrationalism, and so on. And, and this so was done on. in quite a mechanical way, perhaps. Yeah. So, but uh, of course the scholars al always f uh, felt very uneasy. Some tried uh, to avoid that in some way, uh, but um, it, it was difficult to be, to be published then. Uh, but as soon as uh, uh, the situation has changed, and that started already in the 70s, I would say 70s, 60s, 70s, uh, uh, people, uh, the scholars started to do the proper work. 
Uh, still, we had, uh, for example, in administration of my institute, there was a deputy director, and he called me. Uh, he called me because I was the uh, director for the Center for Oriental Philosophy Studies since 1980. And he called me and he said, look, uh, you're doing something wrong. Uh, you uh, uh, concentrate the attention of your colleagues on history of philosophy. We don't need that. You better uh, learn non-capitalist way of development in Mongolia and so on. <laughs> well, it sounded to, to us funny, but also, <laughs> you know, something was to be done. So we have done something with this non um, uh, capitalist uh, way of development. So it was never, but we continue to do. So bureau bureaucrats directing philosophical studies. Uh, yeah, we continued, <laughs> and it, uh, these were the years when we started to uh, translate from Sanskrit, from Pali, uh, uh, classical texts. Uh, and by today, for example, we have uh, uh, translate uh, all sutras of all six uh, shastras, uh, darshanas is translated. Uh, uh, Bhashast, uh, also many of them, uh, Buddhist texts a lot have been translated. So this translation is going on. Uh, even uh, recently, for the last uh, 15 years, uh, we have the translation of giant texts, uh, which never been before. So this work is uh, now uh, seriously taken into consideration. And when you have texts, uh, you can work seriously so on... So the Vedanta texts, Sankhya texts, uh, they're also, they were translated also into Russian? Sankhya? Yeah. Of course. Yeah, okay. when, and, I said, and the Vedanta? when I said darshanas, yeah, yeah. I meant, of all, course, all of them, yeah. first, first right, it is Sankhya yeah. Yoga stars, and yeah. then Yai, uh, Vaisheshika, yeah, yeah. and then uh, Mimansa, yeah. uh, and Vedanta. So With this Mimansa, work, you think, began in the 70s and 80s? Yeah, okay. yeah. And uh, that's why um, uh, after tra uh, we made translations, but we well, uh, made very um, fundamental commentaries and uh, explanations. And uh, I re uh, we even uh, at my institute, we started a new uh, series, academic series, and the Academy of Sciences supported us. This is a series, now it has 18 volumes. This is a series on, uh, uh, which consists of uh, volumes, uh, um, uh, translations and commentaries, and uh, analysis. So, so these are fundamental works. So um, the first one was, by the way, on early uh, Indian philosophy. Uh, they also called it Brahmanic. Uh, um, when uh, Dr. Karan Singh came to Moscow, uh, he was angry. He said, why Brahmanic? He thought that we meant Brahman's philosophy. It wasn't Brahmanic because of the Brahman as a text. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so, and we have, of course, on Vaisheshik, uh, uh, two, three volumes, we have a lot of, on uh, Nyaya, and so on and so on. So, um, uh, by, uh, say, uh, later on, we realized that we can do something more than that, because if we had texts, we could uh, th uh, think more about the uh, categories and give, uh, um, more deep, detailed explanation of Indian philosophical categories. And we dared to prepare Indian philosophical encyclopedia. I don't know if you heard about it. it is, uh, well, I've, I've seen Karl Potter's, it, but it, so is this, is this something on that scale? Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a big, no, it's not like Popper's. Okay. Popper's is- Pot, uh, Potter, Karl Potter. Yeah, yeah Potter, yeah, yeah. but he has uh, different volumes on different right, schools, schools or different periods. Yeah. And ours is real encyclopedia. It alphabetically ah, gives, okay. you know, everything. Right. And it is of more than 1,000 pages, you know. And it, it, all these scholars in India who worked on Indian philosophy were invited. I mean, we had from Pit St. Petersburg, from Buryatia, uh, from Moscow, different universities. So everybody who could, uh, from Kazan, everybody did. And the volume is, uh, happened to be so good that it get the first prize uh, during uh, one of the year. And, and, and now, and when, when did this volume come out? When was the, uh, it was uh, published? In the 80s? No, oh. no, it was uh, uh, 2006 okay. or something, yes. Okay. And later on, we made uh, um, Buddhist ethics. 
the same uh, big uh, volume. So um, your ambassador, a very mm, nice and uh, intelligent person, uh, uh, His Excellency Bhagavan, uh, he uh, wants that to be translated, uh, but I don't know. And when the president came, he also spoke about that. But to, to be to translate in English or Indian languages, it's a big job. I don't know who will be able to do that. So, so in a way, after the collapse of yeah. the Soviet Union, uh, we are free. You're free, and uh, the quality and quantity of the yeah, work that we we are free, been. and that's why uh, 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 as soon as we have become free, uh, uh, what we write uh, is interesting not only to our readers, but we publish a lot abroad. I I don't know a single case when I wrote, for example, any article and I suggested to prestigious journals like East West Journal in Honolulu or uh, Diogen or another, and they said no, uh, uh, we don't. And the same with others, you know. So that's uh, it, it's, and then uh, um, we have much more opportunities uh, to go abroad, uh, to stay there, to study. Some people don't get any grants; they go on their own. But these are really heroes, devoted people. I know my in colleagues in Indian philosophy and uh, the weak, uh, physically weak women, but they go, they stay in the very poor conditions, uh, they pay for the, everything herself, so that to work with pandits. No, but but th uh, this brings me to my next question, which is that um, obviously the environment is now free for you to do your work, but in terms of uh, financial support, academic support, yeah. From, that, that from is the state. Right. That uh, is the second question. Right. So this, this is yeah. obviously a problem. That right. is the second. So uh, in the beginning, I uh, say in 80s, for example, uh, I felt very strong support uh, from uh, administration of the institute, which was unusual because before um, the colleagues uh, in philosophy, uh, this academia, philosophy academy, um, didn't recognize uh, Indian philosophy as Chinese, and they thought like Ge uh, Hegel thought. You know, they are very, very Eurocentric. Right. So that's why they really didn't understand the necessity of paying so much attention to that. But uh, we had uh, uh, about more than uh, it is about about uh, thirty years. We had the directors who uh, understood uh, the importance of that. That's why they promoted um, acad uh, academic exchange with Indian Council for Philosophical Studies. And we had with us regularly, we had Deepi Chattopadhyaya, senior and younger, Kasashi uh, Vananda Murthy, Daya Krishna, Bala Supramani, and All others. The names, yes, yeah. nowadays Arindam Chakarwarthi, other people. And that was great. And our people also used to go. But um, uh, they g also gave, uh, gave us vacancies, which was very important uh, uh, vacancies to get new people for postgraduate courses and then to take them to work with us. So everything was done. And uh, a very important role was played by Indian Embassy. Uh, because during uh, uh, Lamba, Ambassador Lamba and uh, Ashok Sajjanhar was a director of the uh, Cultural Center, uh, they themselves suggested to me, why you don't, est let's establish uh, uh, Indian chair uh, after Mahatma Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi chair on Indian philosophy. Uh, so we had a memorandum and it is continued. It's a very small sum of money. We get 500 dollars for five professors <laughs> and for teachers. That's not a lot of money at all. <laughs> oh, yeah. And if you, uh, and they don't give us dollars, they give us that in rubles. And that's why all uh, um, taxes are taken from us. So it's about 14% uh, uh, of taxes. So it's, it's nothing. Right. But morally, it means a lot. Right. You know, morally, we feel that Embassy also is interested in that. Uh, but before I, I, I want to turn and discuss some of your own work, but before I do that, uh, give us a sense of the level of interest in younger Russians mm -hmm. uh, in Indian philosophy or in Indology. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, are there young people coming forward who want to learn Sanskrit, yeah, who want to learn Urdu? Yeah, it's who very want to interesting. When uh, um, Perestroika started, um, the statistics showed that uh, uh, bestsellers have become uh, poetry and philosophy. Because poetry and philosophy uh, was that uh, part of literature where there were more restrictions than in others. Okay. So we started to publish a lot of uh, things, for example, even Russian uh, philosophy of the 19th, 20th century, you know. Or, and uh, we could, p everything we did, immediately publishers come to us and said, we want to publish you. But, uh, so there was no problem with publishing. But the problem is that the publishers are poor, or pretend to be poor, I don't know. Uh, they, they don't give uh, uh, royalties, Royalty. they give books to us, uh, you know, that's not enough, but people agree. Um, but there is one organization, and this state organization, which helps us a lot. This is a Russian Foundation, a Russian foundation for humanities, uh, for, gr for grants in humanities. Right. And uh, uh, we apply for grants, and they give good grants. Right. And so then, students are attracted by that? And uh, these grants allow us for two, three years to work on some project. Okay. And if we made it, they pay for publication. Right. So, yes. so that, that is a real help. So, so does this encourage students to take up the study of Sanskrit, for example? Um, now, uh, in the past, uh, particularly in the Soviet past, uh, in, in the Soviet past of my age, it yes. means uh, in the end of the uh, 50s, I graduated in 59, uh, the uh, uh, competition to become the student of the Institute of Oriental Studies was very, very high. Uh, many people, were in, young people were interested. That was in mode, I would say. And that continued, uh, I would say, till now. Uh, maybe nowadays it's a little bit less. Okay. Uh, it is a little bit less because, um, because of the situation in education, not only in our country, but in the whole world. Uh, uh, orientation uh, for um, uh, education which will give profit, uh, which will give money, which will uh, be um, practically, you know, give you uh, short money, right. I would say, short money. Uh, yeah, that's why those who go in, the, in our field, they are to sacrifice. And uh, when uh, the postgraduates come to me, those who want, I always ask them, uh, is your family ready to help you? Is your husband or wife ready to suffer until you uh, get your PhD, and even after you get your PhD, your salary will be very small. And even when you start, uh, become professor, but you will be always free. Right. And you will be always able to do what you wish to right. do, you know, and that is a great right. thing. Now, now, as a student, you, you, you learned Urdu, Hindi, Bengali, and you, one of the areas that you specialized in, that you yeah. wrote about, was the... Well, with me it happened, so it wasn't my right. choice. Right. My choice was Hindi, okay. but I was a girl. Okay. And because of that, uh, gender factor worked. So the preference was given to boys. So Hindi group was all consisted of boys. And um, they took uh, 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 two, I think, girls in Urdu, uh, one in Bengali, and that's all. So that's why I graduated Urdu. Uh, but um, I love the language, uh, and uh, I was interested in literature and translation. I had, fortunately, very good teachers. And uh, the last two years, I had an Indian teacher, Zoe Ansari, uh, who was a well-educated person. He translated uh, Pushkin into Urdu. Yeah, very good. Now, now, now you're one of the few <coughs> Russian scholars to have looked at the uh, philosophy of uh, Alama Iqbal, who was... No, this nobody knew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, because when, uh, when I graduated, uh, you know, in my life, everything happened not as I wished. But I am grateful to a fortune because it took me to the right. So how did you, how did you, how did you get to Iqbal? Yeah, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, I graduated Institute of Philosophy, and of course, as everybody, I wanted to work in Ministry of Foreign Affairs or something like that. Instead, I was sent to Institute of Philosophy. Why? 
I couldn't understand. But that's because Institute of Philosophy decided to establish Department of Oriental Philosophy. And for that, they needed people who knew languages and who had a little bit of brains. So I had ex all excellent marks, and my teacher of philosophy said that I would be good. So I became, uh, I started to work there, and I took my postgraduate course. And uh, because of Urdu, of course, I started with uh, Indian Muslim thought. And if you take Indian Muslim thought, you see Said Ahmed Khan, you go to Iqbal, um, and then you go to Abul Kalam Azad, yes. So Iqbal really became my favorite. I translated uh, his lectures, Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam, and I am the only one who translate in European languages uh, at that time. I don't know now, at the time when I translate, I was the only one who translated uh, with bibliography academical. So because Iqbal gave quotations without mentioning pages uh, <laughs> from where, you know, I, I worked in the libraries every, and found it. So I like this book. Iqbal is a very complicated uh, figure. And I think that um, uh, uh, to call him the father of Pakistan, it, it's a political thing, you know. He was the man who uh, really was between uh, two fires. Uh, yes, in the end, uh, he in was inclined more right. uh, for Pakistan. But otherwise, he, you know, right. he loved India and his poetry showed that. Right. But for I, me, I, I for, me for, for me, he, uh, no, I'll tell you what, what is the most important for me. I think he is enlightened uh, Muslim. Enlightened, for example, in the way who, uh, just one example, how he interpreted uh, uh, one of the most important um, uh, concepts of Islam. There is no God but God, or there is no God but Allah, but, and Muhammad uh, is uh, uh, the prophet. And Muhammad uh, uh, is uh, in, interpreted as the seal of the prophecy. So all the orthodox or conservative, will, like Maududi, for example, they will say, oh, since this is a seal, it means after him there will be nobody who will bring any changes, changes are not needed, this is a perfect uh, teaching, right. and this is perfect, uh, perfect uh, order. And they even uh, referred to hadith. Iqbal said no, he said it means, the seal of the prophecy means that God realized that human beings and their reason became so mature, they don't need any Rasuls, right. or, you know. uh, the, 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 this brings me to pretty much what would be my last question because we've kind of run out of time. Yeah. But I, uh, what, in your view, as as a Russian philosopher of Indian thought, of Muslim thought, of Iqbal, would you think is the contemporary relevance of Iqbal's idea of the reconstruction of Islamic thought uh, in today's world? Is there a relevance uh, I wish of Iqbal? Yeah, I think so. When uh, I published my uh, Reconstruction of Religious Thought lectures, it was a uh, bestseller. It immediately sold. It was interesting for Tatars, Bashkirs, uh, Central Asian republics, you know. Uh, and I am sure um, if uh, most uh, uh, publishers, uh, make the publication with proper explanation, right. uh, that will be better because then uh, Muslims themselves will learn about existence of enlightened. And this could play a role in de fighting against some of the more radical yeah, uh, yeah, interpretations yeah, yeah. Uh, that we see today. Yeah. Istanbul Kalamadat, I liked him because I first, you know, I used his library. I came uh, uh, to Delhi. And I went to the library, there were two almaris with uh, his books, and uh, I read them in Urdu, they were. So I read first his commentaries on Quran, yes, and Tafsir. Um, and it was uh, very uh, conservative, you know, right. nothing new. And his approach to Khalifat, uh, in the Khalifat Mufum, it, and then he changed, he radically changed. And, uh, I, I liked in him this ability to, to be changed. And uh, his uh, 
uh, understanding that um, uh, this uh, uh, concept of two nations is really pol political construct. Uh, so, uh, so I think he was a very um, educated and honest uh, pe person in his thoughts. And that's why uh, uh, I wrote uh, a number of articles about him and all of them were published by mainstream, by right. uh, many other journals uh, here. On that note, uh, Professor Marietta Stefanians, we're completely out of time. But thank you very much for joining us on Rajya Sabha TV. Oh, so we're finished. We're done. Thank you so much. I, I, I thought I'll speak and speak. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting to speak with you. That wraps up this episode of IST. As you can see, we could have gone on for many hours. Uh, do join us again next week with another guest. Thank you for watching.